Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's, it's that time of the semester when we all have a thousand other things to do and the play's going on across the way. So I really appreciate you all, your, your coming out tonight. Um, my, I'm gonna make a, a few introductory remarks and they really are all expressions of gratitude. So expressions of gratitude for the Hendricks Murphy Foundation for, for being the main financial support in making this happen. Um, also gratitude to the Mellon Crossings Program, which also contributed and made this happen. And, and a, a word about that, the, the theme this year for Hendricks Murphy, as you all know, is medicine and literature, right? Um, and then I'm part of this Mellon Crossing that, that is studying war, peace, and memory. And so those two things come together tonight, which is why these are our two sources, right, of funds. Um, in this, in this great panel. So the people we have up here, and I'll do a little bit more introduction of them, but basically they are representing the Warrior Writers Project, which is an outfit that has been helping veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan from Operation um, Enduring Freedom by coaching them and encouraging them and providing them networks and support groups for expressing themselves in writing. And then the Combat Paper Project, sort of an allied outfit, um, does a similar kind of thing, but making paper, and making paper out of their uniforms, out of their military manuals, and then with that paper, doing things like using that paper as canvas for art, or using that paper to, to sculpt with, right? Or using that paper to make books, journals, or chapbooks for their poetry. Um, and then our last speaker is, has done a, a documentary film, two documentary films about the Warrior Writers Project and the Combat Papers Project. One of them, which was nominated for an Oscar, um, featured one particular young woman um, with, a, with, a, with a case, fairly severe case of PTSD. Um, I also think that sometimes that the Project Pericles could have also been a sponsor of this because Pericles is really about doing democracy, right? Um, and so, and I'm, I'm referring to both the military experience, but really I'm referring to what they've done after their military experience in terms of doing democracy, in terms of supporting veterans, trying to be um, consciousness raising, right? Um, and the, our guests are incredibly generous with their time. We brought them here this weekend as late as it is in the semester in conjunction with the Arkansas Literary Festival. So after they leave Hendrix, they'll be going down to Little Rock over the weekend to do panels like this in Little Rock, right? Um, and Jan will be doing a workshop for veterans at the VA Center tomorrow. Um, and so it's that, that kind of spirit, right, of just coming and just sharing as much as they can. Drew's gonna do a TED Talk for us on Sunday, <laughs> I believe, right, TEDx Talk. Um, and they're just sort of really sharing themselves these, these several days, and I am very grateful for that. I'm getting there. Yeah, um, and in terms of individuals, I would like to thank, I'd like to thank Lisa Lights for, for helping me <laughs> through this as she coaches me along um, in my introductory remarks. Um, Dr. Mike Sprunger from the History Department has also been a part of the crossing. Of course, Henrietta Vanneman, Sarah Engler Young, who have always been great support in the Murphy program. Um, Melissa Gill, who is in the art department, has offered some of her students to help create some of the posters you've seen around campus advertising this event, so, so much thanks to individuals. This has been a, a long process in terms of planning because we've been working in conjunction with the Little Rock Literary Festival, also with the Little Rock Film Festival because there will be a screening by the Little Rock Film Festival of Poster Girl on Saturday as well, um, with the VA and with the MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History in Little Rock. And one of the things I sort of want to brag about this whole process is that we, got on, we had a phone call, and I don't think Sarah was on the phone call, but I think Drew and Jan were back in the fall, and it was Drew and Jan and, and Lisa and I and Literary Festival folks, the VA, the MacArthur Museum folks, and in this hour-long conversation sort of setting this up, two things that came out of that, which I think are remarkable. For the first time at the Arkansas Literary Festival, there will be a panel of veterans reading their own works that they've created in these kind of workshops. And that'll be on Sunday. They're, some of them are very nervous. They've already sort of gone through a practice session. But I think it's sort of really exciting to have these veterans reading on a panel right before, say, Richard Ford, right, an author, an author of that stature reads. Um, and the other thing that happened out of that meeting was that the VA and the MacArthur Museum started a relationship. And so part of that relationship now is, a, is an ongoing commitment to have a rotating permanent exhibit of works by local veterans at this museum. They've already started, the first exhibit is up, and it's little video clips, sort of video journal clips by these veterans. And, and they have, have sort of this, this arrangement now, this agreement, right, to continue to every several months sort of update that with art by veterans, which is an exciting development out of this. So a quick word of introduction of our speakers individually, um, and then I will let you, and, and basically the format tonight, I will let, will let each of them speak for 10 to 15 minutes about their sort of piece of this, and then we will open it up for general conversation, right? Um, and I encourage you all to participate. There's some more events related to this. So tomorrow, for example, between, at the Murphy patio, 
between 9 and 11 and uh, 1 to 3, Drew will be at the patio showing us how to make paper out of uniforms, right? Um, and you can come and, and take some away with you right after this paper is made. So, so be a part of that tomorrow. And again, the Literary Festival, go to the website for the Arkansas Literary Festival and sort of see their panels all day on Saturday. They're sort of doing stuff, right, all day on Saturday. So check that out. Um, we are really fortunate, I think, to have, have, to have these three with us tonight. Jan Berry on the far, on your left, um, is a Vietnam veteran and has been, I mean, this is, he helped edit in 1971 or 72, 1972, Winning Hearts and Mind, which was one of the first anthologies of poems by veterans. I mean, the war is still happening, right, when this book comes out. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very historical kind of text. And a few years later, 1976, another anthology comes out of poems by veterans with some pictures as well. He's written a half dozen volumes of poetry, chapbooks of poetry, um, a book on a citizen's guide to grassroots campaigns. He was, um, has been a member of, a founding member really, of Vietnam Veterans Against the War um, in the, starting in the 1970s. It's, just, it's a fascinating story to hear him talk right about the formation of that organization. And then he met through, during the Iraq War, he got in contact with Iraq Veterans Against the War and the Warriors Writers Project, which is why he's sort of up on the stage with us tonight. Um, Drew Cameron on the far, on the right side of the stage is our Combat Paper Project representative. And this is his life. I asked him the other day when he, when he was here, or this morning, I asked him, you know, what, do you have a day job? And he said, I make paper. This is what he does. Um, and, and it's phenomenal, and I sort of encourage you to go to the Combat Papers website and sort of see some of the artwork there. And it really is, it's, it's amazing. They've done something like 68, 70 exhibitions of the paper project since 2007, which is pretty phenomenal. There are something like 30, what's my number, 30 libraries have special collections have collected some of these pieces. And, and this is what he does, is travel around the country and hold these workshops, right? And really tries to spread the message. Um, and then finally, Sarah Nesson, who, wrote, who did the film Poster Girl, which will, has been shown a couple times already on campus, will be shown again at the Literary Festival. Will also be shown tomorrow night at UCA. So if you can't make it down to Little Rock, you can go over to UCA tomorrow night and see it. I think it's 7, is that right? I think so. Yeah. Um, so there's another opportunity to watch Poster Girl there as well. Um, and she, what you'll find out, I think, as you watch the film, those of you who have seen the film, it's pretty amazing. So it's, it's about this one young woman who has PTSD and at the end of the film joins the Combat Paper Project as sort of part of her um, therapy. I don't like that word particularly, but part of her getting herself, her act back together. And so it's about this woman and, and Sarah's presence is not in the film at all. There's one moment where you hear her ask a question, but really it's focused on the subject. And what's fascinating to me about the film in that regard is, even though Sarah is sort of not a presence on the film other than that, she still is a presence, right? Because as you're watching this film and you're watching the young woman, Robin, talk and, 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 and emote, you're clearly aware that she had to have had a really special relationship with the person behind the camera. And you can sort of really feel that passion and the intensity of that relationship just by watching Robin. So Sarah's sort of there, even though she's not overtly there. And it's really sort of interesting to sort of experience that. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to each of you. And what I've, what I've asked them to do, again, is to take 10 to 15 minutes just to talk about their experience with these projects, to sort of say their piece, right? Um, about what's why this why their projects why their projects matter, and then at the end of that, I will open it up for questions from all of us. Um, afterwards, there's a reception, so please join us for an informal reception reception out in the hallway. Other logistical things I'm trying to remember: don't forget to fill out your cards right at the end and distribute them in the basket on the way out, and of course, don't forget to turn off your cell phones as well. So, thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the evening. I'm Jan Barry. Can you hear me okay all the way in the back? Let me start off with the way I've often started many presentations after we published this poetry anthology. This is a newer collection of poems that I've written in more recent years. It'll set the tone. Veterans Day talk. On November 11th, 1918, my grandfather on my father's side was on a stateside dock with his army unit about to ship out the fight in France when word was received that the war had just ended. Armistice Day, they called it. Sometimes you're lucky in war, sometimes not. 
On November 11, 1944, my mother's brother was killed in a Navy dive bomber that crashed into the sea in a battle near the Philippines. There was no armistice on that armistice day. Surviving war is no guarantee it's over. Never know when something from the war may catch you unawares, a flare up, a flashback, a smell from a bad day long ago. With two bitterly contested wars churning out more wounded, more dead, more veterans, there's still no armistice on Armistice Day. Veterans Day, they call it now, as though all those war emotions can be contained in a holiday. In Vietnam, I was a Boy Scout turned into Army Radio Specialist. A communications breakdown in a war zone can be fatal. Communications failures among veterans and our support network of family and friends can also have scary consequences. That's what we're here to talk about today. After the parades, the bagpipes, the drums and trumpets, the bugle calls, the solemn speeches, the moment of silence, the hearty drinks at the bar, when memories of war still intrude until our dreams, our lives. There was a news article very recently in a local newspaper about a young woman from this area, Jenny Burrow, who was an Iraq war veteran who killed herself at age 31. This is highly significant for a couple of reasons. I was a newspaper reporter for nearly 25 years, and in the late 70s, the first time I knew a Vietnam veteran who was a local official who committed suicide, I didn't know what to do with the information because the tradition in American journalism is that you don't write about suicides, unless they're famous. Time went by, early part of 2000, another a Vietnam veteran jumped off of a bridge in a town that I covered, and both the editor I worked for and I insisted that was going to go into the newspaper. Time goes forward. In the last few years, there's been these news reports coming out of the VA that on average 18 veterans commit suicide every single day. Turns out that that's a low number. A more recent report by the VA says, well, actually, it's 22 per day. However, they didn't, they didn't include Texas and California, which are two of the largest states of veterans, because they don't have all the state statistics. What I got out of that is they've been hiding from the public and from the veterans and from the active duty military, which also have a horrendous problem with suicides, factual information that could have been provided a long time ago. The fact that this was in a local newspaper and in that newspaper that I retired from, they also had a front page story very recently within the past month, a member of the county legislature, his son committed suicide um, this is what we need to know so we know what's happening. And until very recently, Vietnam veterans simply had a feeling, a sense that we all knew people who had committed suicide. It seemed like an awful lot of people. Last year, the state of Nevada, through a woman veteran, published their statistics. The suicides that had taken place in that state mainly in the 20, veterans in their 20s and their 30s. I looked for the same information in New Jersey where I live. I use my reporting techniques. I'm now a retired reporter and I teach college. It took me a week. I got a run around including a brush off by a general until I could find the person who knew where they hide these things who could get it out of a computer and provide it to me. The state of New Jersey, however, for that same time frame of three years, nearly 60% of the several hundred veterans who committed suicide were Vietnam veterans. This is what they're hiding from us, and they have the statistics in the state death. Um, they keep statistics on every violent death in every state. We're trying to make visible through art things of this nature that are being deliberately hidden from us as a society for reasons of tradition, for reasons of, oh, it's going to cost an awful lot of money to take care of those veterans. 
Post-traumatic stress disorder would not be known about except for Vietnam veterans in the early 70s they decided to put a name to it and put a program to it into, in the VA and, and, and provide the staffing that started that program. Agent Orange, we wouldn't know all the health problems except for, again, Vietnam veterans said, there's a problem, we're gonna find out what the problem is. By the time that investigation was underway, I was a newspaper reporter, which gave me the ability with an editor who had been a Marine in Vietnam who said, I don't care how long it takes, get to the bottom of it. And I discovered after one week, I was the only newspaper reporter in the entire country who didn't have a one week deadline, which usually means the government says there's no problem, we, we reported the story, we, we've done our job. So again, this is the context in which on the one hand, it can seem that culture is a fragile reed. On the other hand, it's one of those ways in which we're able to get underneath deeply hidden, embedded things in our society and start to give them framework, give them a vision, give them a way of talking about them. So that many of these things I'm just talking about, initially were in those poems that came out in 1972 we didn't have terminology, they just talked about this is what happened to me. And when the second anthology came out in 1976, it was all about coming home and the war at home. Again, there was none of the terminology that you could, but it, it, it described exactly what people were going through. Um, we didn't know in that time frame that there was something more to do than write about it, such as do workshops, do outreach, um, make the paper that the book is gonna be in, which lends itself to you're having discussions in the process of making the paper, making the artwork, and in those discussions, something reminds somebody of something, they suddenly say, this happened to me, and they say, I never talked about that before. One of the reasons being, it is very hard to find audiences, including our family members and friends, we want to really listen in, in depth to um, difficult experiences. But through art, poetry, um, suddenly there's a conversation about, oh, so what's that, uh, what's that art about? Or yes, you know, I, I get some insight into that poem, can you tell me more about the poem? And so this is opening up a dialogue, which in many cases is included within families. Um, that participants in these workshops, and we, as much as possible, try to do um, public poetry readings and art shows, then family members, friends, et cetera, come to them and start having that conversation that was so difficult to have around the, the family table. Um, so that's the, the underlying reason for uh, utilizing the process that we're going to go into uh, throughout the several days that we're here in all kinds of different ways, including there are workshops and there are discussions and we are certainly hopeful that will be ongoing uh, discussions and things that come out of this. <clears throat> so those are the main points that I wanted to make. We're excited to be here, uh, to be able to actually spend several days in one place. <laughs> Drew and I last summer ran into each other in Nevada. I was on vacation and I realized he had something going on immediately across the border in Nevada. So that we attempt to uh, interact with each other in various kinds of ways. And then that's how I discovered about that study in Nevada as an example. Oh boy, okay. <laughs> um. I was on tour with Poster Girl for a year um, after I finished the film. It's been a while since I've done this, so I'm, I'm a little nervous. But um, I had the great fortune to, to um, express my feelings about the war and my frustration with what was happening with returning veterans um, through my art. And it took me, took me a while to figure out what that was, what it was going to look like. Um, you know, was it, it going to be just filming 
some things that veterans were doing and posting it on YouTube and you know having little vignettes, or was I going to go all the way and really explore, you know, a story about someone's real, honest, raw experience of of coming home from war and living day to day, and you know, because what what does that really look like? You know, like I was really curious. What does it look like for someone to come home from war where you're, you're used to a certain structure and discipline and way of speaking and being and um, where you're just really molded into um, being a soldier? What does it look like when suddenly all of that is stripped away and you're left with you know, no discipline no structure, um, you know, no support, and more time to really think about what's going on up there, or repressing that with self-medicating or drugs and alcohol, and, um, which, you know, seems to be more of the case <laughs> for so many vets. Um, so, backing up to 2006. I, you know, I was very passionate against the war, and you know I marched in Washington um, prior to 2003, and um, I just it just felt so futile, you know. It just felt like, what am I? I'm just one person. Like, what can I really do? And um, and then I um, I moved to Burlington, Vermont. I was living on Martha's Vineyard. And Martha's Vineyard is a very sort of isolated place. Not many people who live there are really exposed to what's going on in the rest of the world. And that was, but I worked for a, a small production company. They were, they, they were from New York. So real intellectual types, you know, they actually read the New York Times. And, and um, you know, I, it felt to me like once I finished my project with them, it was time to spread my wings and really go out into the world and experience real life, because living on an island doesn't really feel, um, it feels safe, which is nice, but it, it also, you don't really, your world is, is so small and um, sheltered that way. And I felt like I needed to be a part of the world. So I went out to the world, and I ended up in Burlington, Vermont, which is a really progressive town. And um, I just moved into this little, um, art district, and I met, um, there was like all these art studios, and I met this guy over here, and um, he was the first to, first veteran I had spoken to who was able to articulate what, what it's like to have PTSD, and he showed me the first Warrior Writers book, had just been published, it's called Move, Shoot, and Communicate, and um, he told me that he was cutting up uniforms and turning them into sheets of paper. And I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And um, so, but I invited him to come to this art show that I was, I was organizing. And um, he came and read some of his poetry. And the crowd, I'll never forget this. It was, a, we had so many people and um, like the whole town came out to, I, we had a band and lots of food, and you know, I, who knows what they came out for. But there was a lot of really cool art going on, and everybody was socializing and schmoozing. And and Drew and Phil Aleph got up and s read some poetry, and everybody just went completely quiet. And it was just like nobody had heard. I don't think any of us had heard a veteran talk openly about their experience. I think he read, "You are not my enemy." It was a long time ago, it was 2006. And um, so that was like the first t time I'd really had um, an eye-opening experience about you know, the, the effects of, of the Iraq War. And um, you know, my dad served in, um, in the military. He was, he was like gonna get shipped out during the Bay of Pigs and um, fortunately, um, Khrushchev and, and Kennedy figured out a way to nego to be diplomatic and not go to war against each other in, in uh, Cuba. And um, 
So my dad didn't see combat, but you know, he definitely, he, he knew the military experience. He had just um, finished his four years when the draft started, so he got lucky. I probably wouldn't be sitting here. He was a, a paratrooper in the 101st Airborne Division. So anyways, my dad and I are hiking. It's 2006, we're hiking a mountain in Vermont, and he's getting really enraged. He's so mad about the Iraq war, he's just like literally starting to have a panic attack. Like at one point he had to sit down and you know breathe. And he just said to me, you know, he quoted Huey Newton, he said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And he was directly speaking to my generation. He wasn't, you know, yelling at me, maybe he was. But, you know, he really made me open my eyes, like, okay, what am I doing? You know, I'm I'm not really being productive here. Like there's a war going on and I'm just sitting here like with my eyes closed to it. And um, it's really frustrating. But then I, I, this light bulb went off. It's five months after I met Drew. And my dad had been telling me, you know, there's this, he's trying to speak to these returning vets. They're all, they're all these, these guys who just can't communicate. They can't talk about it. But PTSD, it was the first time I ever heard PTSD. My dad was talking about, my dad's a filmmaker too. And um, he said, you know, I'm working with these doctors and nurses and psychologists and we're trying to understand PTSD, but no one's opening up. And, and this light bulb went off and I was like, huh, I know some vets that are really young and really articulate, uh, articulate and completely define the stereotype that I had that veterans don't talk about it. And so as soon as I got back to my house, I looked online, I, I went to see if anyone else had, had, was doing a documentary about what Drew was doing. Because as soon as it, like the idea of making a film about what they were doing and, and using my skills to further promote the work that they were doing and educate the public, um, I thought, oh, someone, someone's already got to beat me to it, you know, like, this is so cool. And I was relieved to see that they didn't have any professional looking videos up on YouTube. So I immediately wrote to Drew and I said, you know, I'd love to help you put out some really solid, solid video work of, of, to represent what you guys are doing. And in the beginning, it was more of a collaboration. I just wanted to express myself creatively, but also help these guys get their message out of what, what they were doing. And, um, you know, which was really processing their experience from war through art and writing and community. And, um, and that was just, that was a, my initial goal. And then I met John Turner. And John Turner was the first, he was the first Marine who came into the Green Door studio and um, cut up his dress blues. And I didn't film the first time he did that because I had just met him for the first time and I didn't want to, you know, be like, okay, I'm filming you and I'm just meeting you. Kind of got to feel it out first. And he was incredibly articulate and powerful and I could just see it in his eyes that he had so much to say. And it was just like bursting out at the seams. And I was just, okay, I'm gonna go run up the hill, get my camera, I'll be right back, you know? So I wanted to just roll the tape as soon as I met him. Um, but I had to wait till the second time I met him. And um, from that moment on, I was pretty much in the Green Door studio all the time. I mean, I had no life beyond that. And, um, and it was really an incredible experience to, to work with the veterans to, to document what, what they were doing with their art. Um, and then it became, you know, there's this whole network of veterans who were involved in, with Iraq, Iraq Veterans Against the War. So there was this broader network, and through that network, you know, I, I included some of the political action that these vets were doing, like at the Winter Soldier event, where they testified against the war and, and talked about the atrocities that they committed or they witnessed, and they spoke their truth. And it was, it was a really difficult time. John Turner, as I mentioned, um, had footage of, of Iraqis that he had killed. And it was the most difficult footage to look at. And he was, he was having a really hard time. 
because it was the first time he was really going back and looking at these images. And um, so, you know, after a while of, of filming veterans that in the beginning are, are really open and excited to share what, you know, what they're doing, it suddenly became dark and scary to be around that kind of energy. And um, I myself went through a really hard time. And there were many times where I just wanted to give up and just put my camera down and just crawl into a hole. And, um, you know, being a filmmaker, you sort of have this, like, veneer of protection. It's like you're not, you're not really experiencing the trauma that they're, your subjects are experiencing, but you really are. You're really right there with them. You're absorbing all that energy. And um, so, you know, but I just couldn't give up, you know. It's just one of those things where um, I had come this far, and I'm talking like a year of filming veterans and following them, Winter Soldier, like I said, in the DNC, the RNC in 2008, and, um, and then coming back to the Green Door and then following veterans to their homes in Buffalo and everywhere. Um, this was a journey, and it was my journey as someone who really cared deeply about what was going on. And at this point in 2007, 2008, PTSD was not a household name. So, and nobody really understood how completely mind-numbingly um, disorganized the VA was. Um, to go through the VA and, and try and get, prove that you have PTSD, try and get your disability rating. Um, I've never, I, I can't even imagine. It's like, you know, you go to the doctor and, you know, you have to wait an hour. I mean, wait an hour. These veterans were waiting years. I mean, up six months to a year to get their claims processed. And even now, there's 400,000, there's probably close to more like a million um, back-ordered claims that the VA still hasn't processed. And, and that's because we haven't dealt with the Vietnam War and the veterans from that war. So it's just, you know, that was part of my, what I wanted to tell. The story, the story was, okay, what is this incredible body of work that they're bursting out this beautiful energy, they're taking all this pain and suffering and darkness and turning it into something really beautiful and sharing it with the world. Um, so I wanted to focus on that, but I also wanted to focus on the, the idea that PTSD is not something that just happens in one day. It's like you have good days and you have bad days, and I wanted to witness that, and I wanted to be a conduit to the rest of the world so that everyone else could see what it looks and feels like to have PTSD. It's not enough to just sit down with the camera and say, okay, tell me about it, and then post that for the world, you know, like I wanted, I wanted people, I wanted to be with the veterans every single day to see those ups and downs and, um, and to experience what it's like to deal with the VA and process your claims and then having them lose the claims and have to file them all over again and, you know, be told that you're not um, crazy enough to get a high disability rating, therefore um, we're only going to give you, you know, um, <coughs> you know, like $300 a, m a month, you know, as opposed to like if you're 100% disabled, then you get maybe up to 3000 a month. But if you have a family, that's all you get. And um, no, if you have extreme PTSD, then you can't really hold down a job. You can't really focus in school. I mean, how do you have just, how do you deal with stress on just an everyday level? So those are some of the things that was really important for me to um, articulate in my two films, and um, I, I think I was successful with Poster Girl because I was able to take that time with Robin. You know, she trusted me because, um, you know, she saw that I genuinely cared, and I think that was, you know, I took the time to really get to know her and get to know, she knew that I had already spent a year working with other veterans and um, focusing on combat paper and warrior writers. And she just, 
it was like an e it was just so easy for her to trust me and um, so I think in the film you really it's it comes across as real like this is this is someone's experience and I can feel it I can taste it I can I can live it with her and it's painful because I'm having a physiological reaction to what she's going through because I'm like this close to her and that's what documentary filmmaking is to me it's like how do you articulate a feeling how do you have an emotional or physiological reaction to someone else's experience and and really that's that's the kind of filmmaking that I wanted to do and um, so I hope you if you haven't seen poster girl you'll get to see it and um, and then on the DVD there's in special features is um, a link to my other film, A Rock, Paper, Scissors, which focuses on the origins of the Combat Paper Project and Warrior Ready. Thanks, sir. Jan. <laughs> and Hendrix College. And Birdie for, <laughs> for um, you know, the endowment that brought us here. Uh, my name is Drew Cameron. And... I'm one of those lucky veterans, I think, who uh, recently after returning home, I'm, that's within two and a half years, after returning home from war, I was able to get connected to a group of other veterans, other activists and people who were purposefully working to deconstruct and speak to the experiences that they had had. And, answer some of the big questions such as um, why were why are we there why was I sent there um, and I don't know if if I had not met those people you know where my life would be and so I'm forever grateful that the work of people like Jan Berry one of my heroes here um, was in place to, to you know you never know what it will affect but 30 let me see here 30 some years after that's published, you know, it came into my hands and it, it really inspired me also. Um, so I enlisted into the military like many people do and uh, right after high school. And I enlisted into the Army, the US Army, and took a job, an MOS, a military occupational specialty, as uh, MLRS, multiple launch rocket system, crew member, field artillery. I was a red leg. And I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma and then deployed in support of uh, what we know to be as Operation Iraqi Freedom in April 7th of 2003. So 10 years ago today, I was um, living underneath an oil refinery on the coast of Kuwait, uh, waiting for my vehicles as we were unloading them from giant naval ships uh, and preparing to push north um, as the second wave in the invasion behind 3rd Infantry and the Marine Corps. Weird, 10 years, you know, there it is. Um, after returning home from the war, I moved to Burlington, Vermont, because in the way that she described Martha's Vineyard, Burlington, Vermont was that for me. It was like this quiet place really far away where I didn't know anybody, and um, fortunately found hand paper making. So this is this craft that, which we can talk about if you are interested, this craft that has this beautiful history and, um, contemporary practice, and I used it sort of as this thing to do. I was first shown it when I was an adolescent and then came back to it after I left the military. And it was like, the thing I wanted to do was just to create paper from raw fibers, from rags, from what have you. Um, and I, like I had mentioned, I met a veteran and became part of this community. And that community for me in the beginning was this organization, Iraq Veterans Against War. And part of the dynamic and of that group was this creative capacity or this desire to want to uh, do some positive and some good. And in a way, part, uh, I imagine, is uh, driven by the amount of sort of negative experiences that were recently um, had by this group of young people and wanting to do something good to maybe wash that a little bit. And so poetry was our first vehicle for that. And Warrior Writers comes out of this desire to, one, carry trauma or experience in a different way, to use creative writing as an expressive therapy, uh, it really is a catharsis, but also as a, as a 
a voice and a message to tell the story because it's it's difficult as we all know and I think as um, as is understood is to put words to things that um, are traumatic it's difficult to speak about it's almost as if our language d it doesn't allow for it so you have to come up with a new language um, so warrior writers uh, is the beginning of this idea of, of transformation or of a community of people um, purposefully engaged in art making. And that just got me all sorts of fired up. And so as a paper maker, um, I wanted to share that paper making process with other people. And uh, through the Warrior Writers workshops and coming together and using prompts of poetry from the Vietnam era and before as a means for us to start writing, because many of us had never been trained in writing or used writing in any way, um, the paper making began in that same fashion. So the workshop, combat paper is workshop based. Uh, and for the past six years has facilitated open, most often open and free workshops available for veterans, their friends, family, and the community to use clothing rag, uniforms specifically, to accentuate the traditional process of breaking the weave of the fiber of the fabric and liberating the individual plant fibers that are trapped in our clothing transforming them into sheets of paper. Um, and since its inception in this um, basement old broom factory in Burlington, Vermont, in the Green Door Studio, it's grown in, in a really kind of uh, organic, grassroots type of way. Because the workshops are free, and often our funding would be like donation-based to include time and labor, which is the biggest one, um, people would choose to become a part of it so um, in whatever biographical availability they had. So in the beginning, we're kind of uh, active duty soldiers on weekend or National Guard soldiers in transition or recently returned veterans coming to this art space and cutting up making paper. And this is building our language. And then we would try something that we hadn't seen before. Somebody else would have known of another technique and, or, hey, do you think that we could make a sheet bigger than eight and a half by 11. And so then beginning to push the boundaries of that, um, constantly inspiring and feeding and growing off of each other and building sort of an archive of work. Our first public workshop, so our first workshop outside of our um, studio in Burlington was at St. Lawrence University, which is in, up near Fort Drum in the St. Lawrence um, Valley, far northern New York, near Canada. And that was on Armistice of 2007, so that was pretty cool. And then from there, it was uh, the game on, so to the point where we developed a completely portable hand paper making mill, um, and had traveled to some 25 states and five countries, and over 100 workshops now, which is awesome, pretty happy about that, and uh, many, 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 many hundreds of uniforms liberated, absolutely, uh, working with Gen intergenerationally often in the workshops from uh, all the way back to include World War II and every major conflict the United States has been involved in, involved in to continuing and current conflicts, every branch of service. So there's uh, a lot of veterans in this country and there's a lot of lessons to be learned from, from the, the road show, if you will. But the, currently what Combat Paper has done is there are four bases, if you will, for paper mills that exist in the country, in the United States, that um, do ongoing programming in their own communities in a way that they see fit. So in essence, we all kind of come from the same uh, principle, but uh, develop in our local network and area as we see fit. So that's in Branchburg, New Jersey, at the Printmaking Center in New Jersey, which Jan Berry is intimately involved with and then uh, Ithaca, New York, in the Finger Lakes region, and that's Nathan Lewis, and um, more often than not, uh, some fellow vets, Jen Pakanowski and Michael Blake. The New Jersey crew is Eli Wright and Dave Keith, um, and Nathan has been starting taking his portable mill and traveling around regionally now, too. Then there's uh, Reno, Nevada, and that is um, a veteran, uh, a mother of a, of a soldier who was killed, and then a, a 
field grade officer who's currently serving, and that's the team, which I think is really great. So they're really connected into the recently returned and currently serving National Guard in Nevada and servicing, just as he said. In filming, we usually break for planes, not trains. Serving that community in Nevada. And then I live in San Francisco, California, and have built um, a uh, hand paper making mill that we call Shotwell Paper Mill, and it's the name of the street it's on. And it's a full production paper book and print, the Holy Trinity, a uh, place where we do a bunch of program to include combat paper programming. So we do uh, commission work and production hand paper, so paper made in the traditional fashion of raw fiber, Eastern practice, as well as Western hand paper, which infers most often rags, um, making it for prints uh, and artists and then doing uh, pretty ambitious book editions with musicians and women veterans and um, sort of anthology and more of the poetry type of work. So my experience since coming home has been that of collaboration with the community um, and specifically in the way of uh, written word, performance, paper, and book. Um, and these are things that I find forever important and will always have a place. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say in the aftermath, but they'll always have, always have a place sort of in our memory, right? It's a way to archive, but it's also a way to create. And for me, it's uh, much of what I hope the work does and what it does if you all come and be a part of it, is helps to, that it'll help to create uh, more of a complicated story than the one that we often hear and know to be true. Um, and how does the story become complicated is, is by the myriad voices of individuals that make up this screaming sea of sound. It wouldn't have been um, all that helpful if I would have came home and turned my uniforms into paper and kept doing that in my studio alone and um, making sheets of paper or making prints and then trying to to sell them to make a name or something like that. Like that wouldn't be very effective. But what happened is that people came in and found their own ownership and leverage in it and took the, the premise, which is based on and inspired by and informed by earlier work, um, called it their own and, and carried the torch forward in that way. And I find that much more effective is when uh, the ideas are shared and, and not necessarily tried to kept secret. So, uh, that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. And so we're looking to hear more about where you all are coming from or what interest you have. So if there, there are sort of two themes in, in this panel, um, which thank you very much, that was, that was really touching to listen to, are conversation and community. Um, and so here we are as our own community, right, to sort of engage this conversation about, about their experiences and, and to engage your curiosity. So the floor is, is open um, for, for your questions and comments. Apparently you do need the mic. Um, are there any of these, I don't really like the word therapy either, of sort of like art release programs um, currently in the military for current people in the military? And if not, like how do you instigate those types of programs? Uh, Combat Paper in New Jersey was invited last fall to do um, workshops at Walter Reed Hospital, and then got invited more recently to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where they have active duty programs for people who are in residential programs for alcoholism, drug abuse, and, PT or, and or PTSD. And there are several other writing and arts programs uh, where various artists and writers uh, come in. Um, this particular one, um, I think is different in that it involves the individuals to be doing something themselves, whereas with some of the other arts programs, professional artists come in and they 
do a drawing of a badly wounded person in the hospital bed. This involves that person in becoming, in some fashion, making the artwork. I was just wondering, as we, uh, as we see women's role in, in combat change here in the past couple of years, um, Sarah, you may be able to speak to this a little more. Uh, what kind of unique challenges do you see female combat veterans facing when they return home, um, or maybe just common problems that are exacerbated by gender? For Robin, it was, it was she would walk into the VA and, um, you know, someone in the waiting room would say, um, are you here for your husband? Or like, you know, showing up at a, an event and, you know, she wouldn't, they wouldn't ask her to speak or just not being recognized or, or accusing her of lying. I mean, it crosses the gamut um, of, you know, because she was a machine gunner in the Iraq war. She was doing combat way before the government even recognized women doing combat. And, um, you know, but finally, they have just passed a law that says women can now serve in combat. But for her, it was kind of a hollow gesture. And I'm, I actually should quote her, because that's what she said. Um, she called it a hollow gesture, because, you know, she's been <laughs> doing it for so long. And, and it's difficult for women to come home and still be you know, figure out, are they, you know, they, ha they have these, there's such a, a, a masculine, um, masochistic energy. If I was in the military, so I don't actually know personally, but I know that women are trying to be just as tough. And generally they are just as tough, but they also have to have, they have to stay tough. They can't break down, they can't cry. And um, even though they're, I'm sure it's grueling, and there's a lot of military sexual trauma as well. And um, one in three women are, are sexually um, harassed in the military. So for Robin coming home, it was, you know, how do you, how do you break down these, these macho walls, and how do you learn to be a woman again, and, and how do you deal with your, your pain? Um, for women, they have it a little bit easier than men in many ways because it's a lot, women are more in touch with their emotions and there's the direct impact of that is that because of the stigma of PTSD that pervade, pervaded the veteran experience for so many years up until very recently, um, there's so many more men committing suicide than women. And, um, you know, I think men are just now learning how to articulate and how to get in touch with their emotions. Um, and I think for Robin, she wanted to, she wasn't speaking from, this isn't a film that's like a gender specific film. In a way, you know, it, it's a woman's experience, but it's also, she's speaking on behalf of, of both genders. It, this is just about PTSD. This is about how do you handle trauma. It's not about, um, really anything else. So I think um, I'll hopefully, you know, her experience mirrors others. Others can, can relate and, and respond to that by opening up. Other questions? As I walk, I, I love the term, Drew, I love the term liberation of the uniforms. It's the first step in paper making. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Barry, you mentioned at the uh, the beginning of your discussion that the um, that the Vietnam veterans were kind of the first ones to bring issues like PTSD to the public attention, and I was uh, I was wondering if you feel as though. Um, the more the modern day the Iraq war for example has less attention or more than because it almost feels as though the public kind of ignores it 
to a certain extent. Have we become desensitized to these issues? I think that the public ignores it until it affects somebody they know. Uh, the difference that we have now is there is the actual terminology, there are actual programs in place uh, which were not in place until the 80s, well after the Vietnam War ended, and it was programs created by Vietnam veterans, networking with other people as well. Um, one of the difficulties is, and I speak now in terms of being a journalist, is to get this kind of information conveyed in such a way that people can understand it um, in ways that family members get PTSD. There's something called secondary PTSD. It's children, the spouse, parents can be affected as well. You can get PTSD from being in a bad car crash, from being in a fire, from being a sexual assault victim, from any number of traumas. We don't usually talk in those terms. Uh, yet we often recognize when we know somebody close to us that they were really shaken by some terrible thing that happened to them. But in most cases, there's not, in, not a program either. Um, and so part of what we try to do here is to provide a way in which people can write or through art illustrate an experience that other people can relate to regardless of whether or not there's the terminology that quite fits the circumstance. Uh, there's another term that's just started to be discussed, which is moral injury. You don't have to have been in the worst combat to have been really shaken by being part of a military machine that destroyed some other city, country, village, or your ideals, what you thought this country was all about, and we invaded the Iraq as an example that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. Um, and that's not taken into account either. It's just beginning to be discussed as something to be considered, and yet I heard very recently from an Iraq war veteran saying, if you go to the VA, don't even bring up moral injury. They don't want to hear about it, which has been the scenario that we've been battling with for quite a number of years. The first time that I went to the VA, 1965, I had a recurrence of malaria. Actually, I didn't know I had malaria, but I had a recurrence of it. I go to a VA in New Jersey, and they said, you can't have malaria. You weren't stationed in Africa, which is a nonsensical response. And a little while later, I'm reading in the newspaper that the VA was overwhelmed with all the different, different kinds of malaria coming out of Southeast Asia, not just one kind. So there's a long history with that agency trying to dismiss people because they just don't want to deal with that problem right now. Um, so again, this process that we're doing may identify, such as the health problems from burn pits. The military came up with this idea that everything, everything should be burned, everything, the electronics. And people's tents were downwind. I talked to somebody recently, and they spent their entire tour breathing this stuff that was constantly being burned. Our government, let alone our society, has yet to identify what needs to be addressed regarding that situation. My other, my other walking comment too, one thing that over the course of the past 24 hours has, has not really come up is, and I think this was especially the case in the first two years after the, the Iraq invasion started, was the dramatic increase in number of suicides among the Vietnam era generation after this war, the, the more recent war started. So I have a question for both veterans, Drew and Jan, but um, basically um, from Sarah's story, Seeing you speak or do your poetry in front of this large group of people, but it's also a common thing for veterans to not want to tell their stories because they don't think that people they don't think people will understand or people automatically say like you were, you said earlier in class like people can't even say like 
I can't even imagine what it's like. Like phrases like that that make this disconnect between the a veteran or soldier and then the rest of us who don't aren't haven't seen those types of things. So what brought you guys to the point where you felt like it was important and you were able to share and express those types of experiences with people and feel like it would affect that it would be good for people like us who don't haven't experienced it but also good for your life and your reconciliation and your reconstruction i guess well i can i can think of the exact moment in fact um so i met this veteran i joined i went down quietly in plain clothes and i went to this event in montpelier and i met this veteran who told me about ivaw and then um, I met this whole network of people, right? Um, and that sort of led to a bunch of experiences. And at that time, part of the, the mission, I guess, of IVAW, who was, being, who was originally under the fiscal sponsorship of Veterans for Peace, which is a lot of Vietnam era veterans, um, the, the main activity that we would do as IVAW was speak because there, um, there are a lot of peace groups and peace-minded people in this country who would um, want to host an event and learn about uh, you know, recent conflict or war, or recent experience, and they'd want to have perhaps a veteran to come speak. So I was invited to one of these, and um, I'd never given a talk before. And it just so happened to be at Northeastern University, and the panel that, was, um, that I was sitting on was Anthony Arnold, the author of Iraq, The Logic of Withdrawal, and Howard Zinn, the author of A People's History of the United States, and Drew Cameron, <laughs> recently returned Iraq veteran. So I had no idea what the hell I was getting into. And, um, and I, I spoke, and all I did was I told my story. I just, I wrote it down the night before. I was super nervous. I was like, this is what I know, and this is why I'm kind of upset by it. And what happened was there was this massive encourage, encouraging response. And I realized that kind of um, in the same way I felt responsible in the, in the army or in the military, I had a continuing responsibility and a continuing desire to serve and feel as though I was doing something uh, outside of myself. Uh, so uh, trial by fire, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was kind of pushed into it. I uh, ended up at West Point after being a soldier in Vietnam there in 1964 when the Gulf of Tonkin happened. I didn't believe the, the official story. I didn't believe the official story that the President of the United States, who was running for election, Lyndon Johnson, said we were not going to send American boys to fight and die in Southeast Asia while they were telling the incoming class at West Point that when you graduate in four years in 1968, you will be leading platoons in combat. And I wasn't going to go back there and try to keep 40 people alive in a situation that when I was there made no sense to the professionals who were stage managing um, a war. We had to create a war to have somebody to fight with. <clears throat> so I decided to become a writer and I'd write a novel that would expose all of this and I discovered I was lousy at writing novels. So I, I write short stories. The short stories unraveled. I got so frustrated. I saw news items about people protesting the war. I was not going to go make a fool of myself running around the streets with these crazy people. I got so mad. I went and I got a job in New York City at the public library looking for the peace movement. They must be there someplace. And there was an advertisement in the New York Times inviting people to come to a demonstration in April of 1967 to march to the United Nations. And talking to a friend of mine who had been in the Navy, we both decided, well, if we go together, and when I get there, there was this enormous crowd of people all dressed up like they were going to church. Families, um, not just young people. And someone said, Vietnam veterans go to the front. And somebody had created a banner that said, Vietnam veterans against the war. And it was this great big, huge group. I think it was 2,000 people in veterans for peace, most of them World War II veterans, all standing in formation. And they marched silently. 
to the United Nations with people on the sidewalk hollering and screaming. And I thought, this is not what I want to do. However, when we got to the end of this parade route, I said, well, so where does this organization, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, meet? Oh, there is no organization. We just have a banner. I helped to track down people to start an actual organization, and we had a big, huge argument about what name, and we couldn't come up with a better name, so we stuck with the name on the banner. We started by six people, and I've talked about this ever since. No matter where you are, community level, dealing with an international issue, you get six people together, you can do a lot. And then you start networking those six people and reaching out to other people. I was a frustrated writer for a very long period of time until one of the other veterans said he'd been collecting uh, poetry and short stories and artwork and photographs and he wanted to put together an anthology and since I lived in New York, could I help him find a publisher and all the publishers turned us down. And I was noticing that other groups, such as women's liberation groups and black activists and Puerto Rican activists were publishing their own work. I thought, wait a minute, we could do this. We could publish our own book. And that's, that was the genesis for putting together an anthology of poetry. And as we were putting it together, I said, you know, of the materials we're getting, we could tell a story as opposed to alphabetically, however you arrange an anthology. So it starts off with arriving in Vietnam and then bit by bit discovering things are not what you thought they were, um, which is an unusual way of putting together an anthology. And as we were putting together, every once in a while, I would see like, there's a gap here, but you know, I had that experience. I could write about that. And I wrote poetry that I had no idea that I could do this. That was a discovery of my own. And when the book came out, we had all these invitations to read the poetry, and I suddenly discovered people would listen to the poem version. We didn't listen to the prose. I'd been the speaker for a while, and people didn't really want to hear a long version of any of this. They would listen to the poetry. And that was another huge discovery to me. And um, I really didn't relish the prose version of being a speaker. Even now, most of the time, if I have to do uh, public speaking, I write it all down so I don't forget something. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm making use of this poem that's already written down, um, which is something to learn in terms of how you want to approach being able to communicate to the public. And um, initially, and, I, and I've talked about this, I, I sometimes teach public speaking classes, it is scarier to give a speech than to charge in the machine gun fire. That's how most military veterans see it. They would rather go into that dangerous situation than give a speech. And that's what we are trying to also encourage people that, well, you know, if you could do the workshop, and then, well, maybe can you, can you come and join us? You know, we're going to be doing a reading and, you know, I have a friend, however, who was in Vietnam, he has two purple hearts, he would have run out of this room right now if I pulled out one of his poems and started to read it, because the emotion is too much. So there's that, that aspect of it as well. And so at a certain point, you realize you are speaking on behalf of other people who, for one reason or another, cannot deal with the emotional aspect of it. They get too tongue-tied. And, and he said, this guy I'm talking about was a producer for CBS News. He knows how to communicate. But these are the things in which we become partners in, in collaboration of uh, trying to help tell a larger story that goes beyond our immediate um, uh, experience. In, in W.H. Auden's famous elegy for William Butler, Lake, William Butler Yeats, he sort of raises the question, does poetry um, make anything happen? And, and I think tonight and today's experiences really do suggest an answer to that question, right? The poetry does matter and does make things happen on a very personal, very personal way, right? Um, and, and community way, communal way as well. Um, thank you all for your, for your attendance. Thanks to our speakers for, for their time and thoughts and their, and their passions and talents over the years. Um, please join us for an informal reception out in the hallway and don't forget to fill out your feedback card and please a round of appreciation for our guests. <laughs>